this is now uh, Donna Farber's slot. Uh, Donna, you can start anytime you want, but uh, please let me know if you are okay being recorded. Yeah, I'm fine being recorded. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Okay, good morning, everyone. Um, so I'm going to be talking to you about um, uh, respiratory, the immune response to uh, respiratory virus infections. So we work on uh, the immune response to uh, different respiratory virus infections, including influenza. So I'm going to show you some data of how we're going to use the concepts and approaches uh, to study respiratory immunity to actually apply this now to SARS-CoV-2. So the general scheme of an immune response to a, to a virus infection is you'll get this initial virus infection, which will stimulate and activate the innate immune system, uh, particularly the, pro the production of type 1 interferon gamma. That will act to control, for early control of viral load, and also to promote and uh, to induce the adapt immune response, which is um, the expansion and differentiation of, of virus-specific CD8 um, cells and CD4 cells. These are going to promote viral clearance either by directly killing virally infected cells for CD8 cells or also by pro-inflammatory -inflamm functions for CD4. And CD4 cells will also help B cells make antibody. And these antibodies are produced in serum and uh, act to clear the virus. So the peak of the adapt immune response is really after usually the virus is cleared. So all of these reactants are clearing the virus. The immune response is then contracts, it goes down, uh, but not really to baseline. And there are virus specific T cells as well as antibody and virus specific memory B cells that persist so that you, when you meet the virus again, you have protective immunity. So that's in the ideal situation, but depending on the viral pathogen, uh, pathogenicity, uh, this whole situation can change. And that's really what we're seeing in COVID infection. And this we really can see about how um, in, in a mouse model where you just give the mouse different doses of virus, how you can have a very different type of response. Um, so in terms of morbidity in a low dose, you'll uh, if for morbidity for virus infection for mice, they lose weight. Um, it's for, due to cytokines and just they're not really feeling very well and they don't eat. Um, so, to a low dose, the morbidity goes down and then the advice recover a medium dose. And these are logarithmic differences in the viral dose. Again, the morbidity is even more severe, but they recover. And with a very high dose, they really don't recover at all. However, if you look at the viral clearance, you can see that to all the different doses of virus, the virus is cleared um, and with a similar kinetic. So the virus is cleared by day 12 for all of these um, different doses. Uh, but if you look at other um, clinical signs morbidity, which would be O2 saturation. So this is really a sign of um, like ARDS. You can see that at day 12, um, at day 12, but even though the virus is cleared, um, the, vir the mice that get the very high dose, in fact, don't recover, and they have very low oxygen saturation, where the mice that had um, the other viral loads are, um, are recovering. Um, so what are the causes for this kind of immunopathology? So you get the protection, the viral clearance, um, but not, but you actually get damage and disease. Uh, one is a cytokine storm. This is due to innate immunity and it's relatively rapid. And you can see that, that airway cytokines two days after a flu infection are quite high. Type 1 interferon and uh, IL-6 among other chemokines. But you can also have a type of T-cell mediated immunopathology. And this is, um, can be seen um, uh, in, sorry, in a type of flu infection. Um, I'm sorry. Um, sorry about this. Um, and this is T-cell mediated. So in this case, you can have T-cell mediated immunopathology. If you take uh, an inhibitor, a modulator that will reduce T-cell activation can reduce the T-cell immunopathology, but keep that protective immunity. So another way, um, so we've been looking at ways um, that you can optimize a T-cell response to have that protection. And one way that it can be optimized is through tissue resident memory T-cells. These are generated after a viral infection. They are maintained around the airways in the lung. And if you have a mouse that has tissue resident memory cells, um, they are fully protected from lethal challenge. And they're more protective than circulating memory cells, which will cause, which aren't very protective and cause immunopathology. In a mouse model of SARS infection, which is done, this is done by the Perman lab. They've done a lot of 
uh, studies on immune response to the virus, they showed that the airway memory cells are protective to SARS. This is a SARS-CoV-1, the initial SARS virus. If you deplete those airway memory cells with an anti-CD4 antibody uh, administered intranasally, you lose that protection. So how do we then study? So uh, respiratory immunity, which is, is highly important for, for mediating protection, also to regulate <laughs> respiratory immunity so you don't get a lot of immunopathology. So for fact, the past seven years, we've been studying this by getting um, respiratory samples, uh, and this is a, in, with children, infants and young children in the pediatric ICU that have respiratory infections. And this is um, all the subjects that we have enrolled and gotten samples from, and they have all sorts of different respiratory um, infections. Some are coronavirus, but this would be the seasonal coronavirus. Most of them are respiratory syncytial virus, most of them are RSV. So infants, um, especially infants and young children, most get RSV, some recover fine and some have problems and get ARDS and need to be intubated. That tube is washed as part of clinical care. We get that, um, that wash and then also blood and we're able to study uh, the uh, airway response over time because we get it every day. And you can see the T-cell response. Donna, we are at your time limit, just a reminder. Okay, so the T cell response in the airway is quite different than in the blood, and that you get more CD8s in the airway of infected children. You can follow this over time. And we've been also able to correlate the presence of CD8 cells with lung injury in these children. And also uh, the more CD8 cells you have, you have reduced viral load. So again, that uh, instance of where you're getting protection, but you're also getting uh, immunopathology and injury. Uh, we also get lung samples um, through organ donors and we're able to look at the immune response to flu, which is quite different in a young person, when you can look at, um, this is actually flu specific T cells, looking at their memory um, and that their tissue resident memory, mostly in adults, but not so much in children. This is just some of the markers. So how are we gonna, what are we going to um, address then in the COVID patients? So we wanna know whether viral clearance is associated with a composition or molecular signature of adaptive or innate immunity in the airway. We wanna identify immune correlates with severe disease severity and the association of age, sex and comorbidities with the immune response. And then also in future studies of pathways to target for modulating immunopathology and to find whether long-term protective immunity here and regenerated. Um, so just to tell you what our plans are, our immediate plans, we have an IRB to get, um, it, it's almost uh, in process, I mean, it is in process to get respiratory samples from both the adult ICU and PICU, uh, the way we've been doing with the children, we'll do a longitudinal analysis of endotracheal tube washes and analyze the immune cell complement, the viral load with David Ho's group and transcriptomics uh, with Raul Rabadon. Uh, eventually, we'll be able to, when we get these tissues again from organ donors, we'll be able to look at long-term memory. Um, so in the lungs, um, we'll be able to see whether there is T cell or B cell memory in the tissues and in mouse models for immunomodulation. Uh, we're going to be looking at, uh, we're talking with Bristol Myers to look at some immunomodulators. So that's it. Thank you. That's great. So we have time for a few questions if uh, anybody wants to raise their hands. Uh, okay, uh, Jahar, go ahead. You can unmute yourself. Uh, this is Ira Tabis. I was muted. I'm sorry. I raised my hand. Um, so, oh, okay. Donna, um, I'm, I'm sure you're familiar with this uh, COVID-1 study by Stanley Perlman, where they looked at a delayed interferon response as being damaging because it led to an infusion of inflammatory macrophages in the lung. Can you comment yeah. on that? Yeah, so I mean, there's evidence that the innate immune response to this is, um, is defective. And also, it seems to be harbored for a while, too, so people can have it, but not really being uh, having a, an, a, an appropriate innate immune response. So it could be that you do have macrophage dysregulation. And that's one of the things we're going to be looking at in these airway samples. Are, are there macrophages in the airways? What kind of macrophages are they? Um, and what is sort of the longitudinal uh, accumulation of macrophages in the airways? But, but, but do you think that that could be due to uh, a dysregulation of the interferon response? I mean, it, it could be, it could be. I mean, we'd need to look at, um, so one of our collaborators is actually gonna be looking at the um, plasma cytoid DC response to, um, to SARS-CoV-2 to see if there is uh, that defect in interferon in type one production. 
Kent, Johar. So we cannot hear you, Jahar. He's probably no, we can't. he's probably muted. No, it's actually I can see okay, he's not no, muted. No, but, okay, ah, no, no, okay. No. Can you hear me? Yeah, now we can hear you. Okay, sorry about that. Uh, so I was on the same question as Iris. Um, so I'm going to ask you about the Perlman work, but come across some data that uh, type one IFNs are not found in the bowel of SARS-CoV-1. So mm -hmm. what's the data for SARS-CoV-2? Is IFN one completely uh, abrogated uh, in, the, in, in these uh, coronavirus diseases? I mean, so that's not known. I don't, I haven't seen, um, I mean, there's not a whole lot of data on the airways or some, I mean, mostly viral loads, but I haven't seen whether they have actually measured type one. I mean, in the SARS-CoV-1, there is that, that potential defect in type one interferon, um, which would be consistent with this virus sort of hiding out too in the lung. There's a question by Martin Markovitz. Yes, uh, hi, good morning. Um, thank you for your talk. I was just wondering if you can comment on some animal data. Um, uh, uh, Chen et al. reported that um, either vaccination against the uh, spike protein or spike protein infusion um, actually skewed the, um, the monocyte macrophage response in the lungs toward a pro-inflammatory um, um, type of response as opposed to a healing response. Similar um, reports were seen in, in Balpsy mice that were vaccinated against the spike protein. And finally, uh, ferrets that were vaccinated against the spike protein developed a severe um, hepatitis that was not seen in control animals. Might you comment on these responses and kind of put it in context with some of the approaches that are being taken currently? I mean, so vaccination with the spike subunit? Let's well, it's, um, it, these are uh, either recombinant uh, constructs that express the spike glycoprotein and generate an antibody response, or actually giving the spike, uh, the, uh, the spike protein itself has generated a skewing in the uh, or thought to skew. There's pretty good evidence, especially in the Chinese resistance CAC paper. Um, believe with ACI. Um, I would comment on that, or is that not an area that, is, that you investigate? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, with the vaccine or the, the immunization with these proteins, it's, it's sort of, I, I guess, really early days. I think some of these manifestations, uh, when you're talking about hepatitis, maybe, I, I'm just wondering whether that's sort of a, you know, kind of a cross-reactive uh, uh, autoimmune response. Um, but, uh, but I'm talking about lung disease that was seen in the animals that were vaccinated or given infusions as opposed to controls. So who were challenged spike, then, antibodies, right? antibody, antibody responses to spike protein made the lungs much worse than control animals. So, so this is in the, when they were challenged. So you're talking about this body media enhancement? Yes. Yes. yes, so they, so yes. they were yes. they were given the right. protein, right. then they were challenged right. intranasally with virus, and then they right. had a, a much worse course. Right, so that's that's that can happen. So that that is one you know kind of a deleterious outcome of some antibody responses, and that they're going to cause antibody mediated enhancement of infection by coding. So these virus coded with the antibodies are taken up by macrophages or monocytes that have FC receptors. So it actually enhances the infection. So you can make it a little bit worse sometimes when you have uh, the antibodies. That happens in dengue virus infection. So that is a potential, um, you know, complication of some of these vaccines and and, uh, and generating antibodies. So that is something that has to be has to be looked at and optimized. Thank you. Great. Um, if there are no other questions, anybody else with questions? I think we are all good. Go ahead. Hi, I have I have a, a brief question. So um, uh, I I was reading some papers in SARS, and uh, there were these mouse models that they were recapitulating some of these uh, age and sex dependence, so that yeah. older people they get uh, a stronger kind of effects and severity, and also that males I mean is much higher than females, and that was reproduced in mice. 
So I was wondering, I mean, do you know if these mouse models, they are able to recapitulate some of the effects in the immune system that you're, you're looking at, in particular the macrophages? Yeah, I mean, the, um, you know, the SARS-CoV-1 mouse model does re recapitulate the, the male bias. It does. And it, it's really interesting. It's not, you know, exactly known what the, what the mechanism for that, but it does recapitulate it. Um, so I think these, these mouse models are quite good in terms of the immunopathology, the, um, and, and some of the clinical signs are recapitulated. Yeah. Yes, I, I have read also, I mean, in one of the papers, they were doing some es uh, estrogen suppression and they were, they were the older females, they were getting uh, severe symptoms as the males. So I was wondering if there is some research done in, in kind of a hormonal, um, I mean, relationship to the severity of the disease. Yeah, I mean, there's whole, there's people who are working on on all sorts of sex differences with the immune system. Salva Klein from uh, Hopkins has probably done, you know, the most extensive work with that. You know, some of it is hormonal, some of it's not. I mean, there's some differences in B cells uh, that are known between males and females. So, um, yeah, and I think what's happening with this virus, that's why it's going to be really interesting to look at these sort of local immune responses and stratified by sex, stratified by age. And so we can really, you know, the more and more patients you see, you, you can really kind of at least draw some correlations.